Um, uh, what else? Oh, we would like to thank the organizations who help make our work possible and give us funding to, to bring in amazing guests like Lauren and Courtney, our sponsors, Bank of America and the Bar Foundation. Um, the Arts Boston team actually saw a version of the presentation you're about to see uh, at APASO, the Association for Performing Arts Service Organizations in Austin, Texas in May. Uh, and this keynote presentation is something that we've been mulling over and talking about our office pretty much every day since um, <laughs> over the last two years. Arts Boston has programmed workshops that illuminate the importance of equity, diversity, and inclusion in arts and culture. Uh, from Carmen Morgan and the art equity teams in terms of trainings to our hiring and retaining a diverse workforce uh, panel last month, uh, my colleagues and I have tried to provide insight and resources to those looking to include traditionally marginalized voices in the story and future of their organization. Uh, many of our members uh, at Arts Boston have rigorously, rigorously engaged in this investigation of themselves over the last few years, and Arts Boston has been alongside you in that. Um, as a staff, we continue to have the difficult conversations about power, privilege, implicit bias, white supremacy, and our role in all of the above. Um, but I know some of you are also thinking, yeah, absolutely, we have done that. The soul searching has been excellent, but what's next? Uh, using Fracture Atlas as a case study, my hope today is that you take back practical tools and tactics to your organization to put your values in, into action on a day-to-day -day operational basis. Uh, the work Fracture Atlas has done is to dismantle power structures and promote justice in their workplace is nothing short of inspiring, but I'd like for them to tell you more about that. So without further ado, here are Courtney Harge and Lauren Ruffin to tell the story of Fracture Atlas. Welcome everybody, uh, I'm Courtney. Um, Super excited to have this conversation with you all. Lauren. Hi. <laughs> um, I clearly am somebody who likes to talk, I, I, which is one of the reasons why Lauren said she likes to present with me. She <laughs> to be here. I like to, to, to take up some space about this, but I want to be clear that we are really open to having this as a conversation. So we're going to present what we're doing, we're going to talk a lot about um, why we're doing it, but we're hoping that the majority of our conversation today is really kind of brainstorming with you, talking about your ideas, hearing your concerns and feedback. So um, just to give you an idea of what's happening, that we, we hope that you are present and available and ready to like go on this journey with us. Fantastic. Um, so I do this super high tech thing while Courtney's talking where I have to sit here and advance the slide. So, um, <laughs> That's why yeah. it's, it works for us. We're a dynamic duo. <laughs> it's fantastic. Um, so this is just a brief kind of roadmap of what we're going to do today. I like to be able to orient where we are um, and as we travel. So ultimately, it's who, who we are, who are, who are we as an organization, who are we individuals, and what, what did we do, and what should we do? What do, what can you do, what do you want to do? Super simple. Um, just to give the overview for those who aren't familiar, Fractured Atlas is a national art service organization. Um, we serve uh, artists everywhere, um, of all disciplines um, and of all sizes of organizations. Um, there are, we have four major programs. They are fiscal sponsorship, um, which is our fundraising tool, insurance, which is a tool to help you manage your person, your <coughs> property, your practice. Um, Artfully, which is ticketing and customer relationship management, and Space Finder, which connects venues with artists and vice versa. Um, this is a brief overview of our numbers. So we currently have over 72,000 members, um, basically sponsoring 4,100 active projects. Um, we've raised, helped them raise over $152 million, um, which is kind of, which is exciting for us. Um, I was talking to Tim, our COO, and he was like, when did we hit 150? We, were, we, were, we just, we actually got past 150 million before we could notice, which was, which was exciting for us. Um, we found over 17,000 insurance policies um, and serve a, a network of over 1.3 million artists. Um, That's you. That is me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, one of the ways I, I, I like to start is to talk about my own journey into Fractured Atlas as an organization. I specifically like to talk about my first day, um, but more specifically our first two days, my first two days. Um, my second day, um, well, one when I joined Fractured Atlas uh, three years ago, I was one of four people of color in the entire organization. Um, and uh, my second day, we had a staff meeting. That we used to have monthly staff meetings, and we had um, our, uh, a section of the staff meeting was uh, Ask the ED 
which was actually just one of my favorite things. It was something, it was a moment of transparency where in the all staff meeting, you could just publicly ask the executive director at the time, Adam Hutler, what, anything you needed to, to ask him. Um, there was, we had a colleague who occasionally would ask him like, what's your favorite breakfast cereal? Or, it, but it was a moment of like transparency and action that I really enjoyed. Um, and so it was my second day, so I was like, well, I just got here, so if I can get fired, let's do this today. <laughs> um, and the question I asked was, you know, you said that you want to be an anti-racist organization, I said, but what does that actually mean, and what do you actually do? Um, and I, I, I offer the power structure in that. Again, I'm, I'm literally the newest person on staff at that point, asking our white male executive director in front of everyone, <laughs> what does this mean? Um, and for me, the stakes in that question were very much like, how you answer this question really determines if I'm coming back tomorrow. <laughs> um, I don't know if he knew that at the time, <laughs> but, but that's, it was important for me. Like if, if you can't answer this in this space, then you may not be the right fit. And, and he gave me an answer which I loved, which was, I don't know, and I don't think we're doing enough, basically. Um, and being willing to say that in that space and then be accountable to that when I, Asked the question again like three months later, like what did we do now? And then it made, became a moment where it, it, <laughs> he's, he's told me once that he continued to work through those things, partially because he knew I would continue to ask the question. Um, and it was beautiful to me that he was always willing to engage in the question, that, that showed that I was in a space that was willing to tackle the things. Because part of the journey of this work is being willing to do it, because it will never be done. We will, <laughs> We will never succeed, right? Um, there's, it's not going to be, it's not going to be finished because there was so much things. There's so many things to undo, but somebody who is willing to be accountable and open and and take the steps to to at least engage with the work um, is the environment. So if nothing else, that is the that is the, the step everybody has to make. Not make the right answer, but you need to make some answers, make some decisions. Uh, next me. Um, so I have, um, I came to Fractured Atlas after primarily spending my career in DC um, doing um, homeless services work, um, human rights stuff, um, lobbying and advocacy. Um, and I hadn't realized until my second day at Fractured Atlas that I had never worked with white people before. Um, I've always been in predominant organizations that very large organizations that were led by people of color. Um, and I just had never occurred to me. Um, and I, I had a similarly sort of um, really earnest experience with, with Adam. Um, the second day I was in the office was the, the day that um, Alton Sterling and Philando Castile were murdered um, by police. And um, while I'm not religious, I was always in environments with folks where um, when something would happen, we would all take a moment as an entire organization. Um, you know, I worked on, I worked in um, an organization where we had a large campus and there were kids and homeless families and we would all go up and stand and hold hands around the entire um, the campus and someone would say a prayer and we'd just take a moment of silence. Um, and it was very weird being in an environment where no one acknowledged anything that happened. Um, everyone was obviously sad, but there was no opportunity to create space for healing or for just talking or just to sit in silence. Um, so over the two years I've been at Fracture Atlas, I think one of the things that we've gotten a lot better about was just having these conversations out in the open um, and about the sort of um, trauma that we all experience in our country as an effect of, of racism um, and having a space where folks can bring their entire selves to work. Um, and, and we'll get sort of more through that, but um, I'm excited to be here today and to talk with y'all. Um, so that is two fractured atlases, that is who we are. Um, we're gonna keep going, but it, it's important to talk about, like, I know I'm, I won't speak for Lauren, but I, I can connect on this, and say that getting to be who we are at work was important to us because we are awesome, and we should get to bring all of that awesome to work. Um, and making sure that environment supports that um, is valuable to us personally, but also like we'll talk about some of the ways in which, in like a mercenary way, it is valuable to the organization. You, if you want me working for you, you want all of me working for you. You want me in my best capacity, and that is true, I believe, for everyone. So this takes us to like one of the defining concepts of how we talk about this, um, and it, it's the different types of organization. There are a variety of scales, there are a variety of types of organization, but one of the things we really focus on is this journey from being a shared employer organization to a shared purpose organization. So a shared employer organization is, is one where you, you, you go to work, you get your check, this is, this is the only thing we have in common is 
we go to work, <laughs> right? Um, you know, we've all, I, I used to work retail jobs a lot, and it was like, we, we show up here to do a thing, and we go home. That is, that is what we do, and our, on our job, literally here, is to just have the job, right? Um, and that is a shared employer environment, right? And there's nothing necessarily negative about that, but it's worth acknowledging that that's a type of space. Um, the next is a shared identity um, organization. And this is, I will say mistakenly, the type of organization that most people think they want. And the shared identity organization is the organization where we're all, we're all friends and we all like, we get to maybe drink after work and we really enjoy being in this place because we are all the same. We are, and, and in some ways we are also all in this together. It can be positive, but believe it or not, it's also extremely alienating if you are not in that shared identity. And you can all be the same, quote unquote, but what are you doing that for? Right? Um, I say there have been plenty of places where just as a black woman, I knew I was not in the shared identity. Um, but I did a lot to pretend to be in the shared identity. Um, I have a friend who talks about how um, much she actually hates work parties because they're like, there's still work. <laughs> right? There's still, like, I'm going to work and I'm still kind of, I have to in some ways perform my like work identity because this socialization in this space is about me fitting in um, and it's an additional burden for anybody who feels marginalized or anybody who doesn't feel that they can address what the shared identity is. Frequently shared identity organizations don't outwardly <coughs> say what that identity is. You just know. This is, this is where we get into conversations about workplace culture, where we get into like, is this person the right fit? We get into a lot of coded language about who fits where. Um, and so shared identity can, is one of those things that can look more positive than it actually is on the surface. Um, and lastly, it's a shared purpose um, organization. It's, it's what do we do? What are we here to accomplish? How do we make the impact? Ultimately, particularly working in the arts, our goal is to create joy for the rest of the world in a variety of ways. We are trying to make something magical happen. Um, and we, if we focus on just being shared identity, we forget that actually our goal is to send positivity out in the world. Our goal is to, is to impact change somewhere. Um, and if you're focused on what you're doing, on what your purpose is, on your, your, your true kind of goal, you can more readily appreciate a multitude of voices to get you there. Um, you get less trapped in like, well, we don't do that, and more about, well, why don't we do that, or why can't we do that, or why haven't we done that, because it could lead to accomplishing our purpose. Um, if you don't know where you're going, you'll have a hard time knowing if and when you get there. That's another reason for having purpose. A lot of times, we work on our missions, and we are just doing things because we've always done them, but are we assessing, are they working, are they what we want them to do? Um, and this work is not theoretical, it is lived experience, right? We get very much into, sometimes even with a shared purpose, get into this idea of like, this is what we're doing, or we get into equity, diversity, and inclusion work because we know like intellectually it's the right thing to do. We know that we are like, it's time, and it's, it's timely, and it's something that's important. Um, but this is the lived experience of many people you're working with. It's why I often, I like to start this with how we came into an organization. Uh, because we are we are people who walked in with experience and identity and and how we live in the world impacted how we worked in that space. Um, so equity, diversity, and inclusion work isn't just an initiative. It isn't just like a plan or something that you know it's something we should get around to. It is in fact the lived experience of people in your organization if if it's not yours. Um, so your core values, your organization has them even if they don't, even if you don't know what they are. <laughs> one of the things like Lauren and I talked about before, like one of our core values at Cracked Atlas um, is that we generally don't do early meetings. We're just, we're, we are there. Everybody's working early, but we, 
don't really schedule a meeting before 11. 11. <laughs> yeah. That was a big cultural shift for me. It's like, okay, when we do our stand up, they were like 10 30. I was like, 10 30? I've been up for six hours. <laughs> what are y'all doing? That's not the yeah. beginning of my day. You really know. It's 11 o'clock. You're gonna, that's when you're going to get it. We're going to work. You're going to get some solid like 11 to 3 meeting time, right? Um, but that's, it's nothing that's not officially our, our value. That's not a, it's nothing that's on any of our paperwork, but it just becomes, it's become part of the way we work. It's, a, it's an organizational value. Um, and we adjust. So you kind of start at the middle of the day and work your way out. But it's just how it happens. And your, your values tend to be the behaviors that you reward. <laughs> right or acknowledge like and so you can say you value transparency um, but if you have a whole bunch of closed meetings then you don't <laughs> right or if you say you know we value like new ideas but people tend to be punished for having new ideas by either getting no support or no backup or no ability to implement then you don't and like I think that one, you might want to say that again. That is some people. <laughs> that, one, that one got some people right <laughs> But it's, it's it, it, what you value, you, you reward, right? And so I've been in places where it's like we value like integrity, but tend to reward like backbiting, right? Like where we say this is what, this is say what, this is what we do, but what do you actually do? And, and it's worth knowing. Um, these are, Fractional analysis values that we, these are our public values, right? That we embrace challenge, we make it happen, we see continuous improvement, and be excellent to each other. We try to be excellent to each other. Um, and I think it's funny, I think, in a way for our values uh, is that we, we, we joke about our values in a way that is fun, in that, like, frequently, like, if something breaks in the office, you're like, all right, be excellent, right? <laughs> like, it'll show up. But I say that to say that we, we do value being excellent to each other around like, how can we take care of each other in the space? But the fact that we can joke about our values means we are actually constantly in conversation about our values. Um, we, are, we recognize that your values are, are things you do, things you live, and so we can't, we can't say we have these without actually engaging with them. Um, this is from uh, Netflix's infamous PowerPoint presentation, but um, to talk about how values can like creep up. Um, so, many companies have nice sounding value statements displayed in their lobby, such as integrity, communication, respect, excellence. Can you guess where these values came from? Anybody? Nope, okay, we'll just, we'll just go for it. These are Enron values. <laughs> um, these were displayed in their lobby. And so it just shows that, again, the things that you say you do can be very different from the things you actually do, from the behavior you reward, and from the, the, the systems you have in place to support. Um, oh, this is a fun number. Um, so what do you all think these numbers represent? So 15, 15%, 85%. All right, I'll give you a general hint. One of them is the number of people who are currently engaged in your organization, or the percentage of people who are currently engaged in your organization. Which one do you think? <laughs> All right, who thinks it's 85% of people are engaged? Raise your hand. <laughs> Thanks, John. Punch her in the back. All right, so 15%. 15% of the number of people in your organization who are actively engaged in your work. Um, most nonprofits have staffs of 10 or less, so that means, go to the next one, it's one and a half people are currently engaged in your organization, right? Um, Chances are, if your organization is less than 10 people and one and a half people are currently engaged, that's you. <laughs> You're here. <laughs> okay? Which means that 85% of the people, everybody currently at the office right now, is not as engaged as you are. I'm so sorry. Um, the rest are, the yellow are disengaged, which in this case are, are neutral. Um, but it is easier to turn a neutral negative necessarily than to positive. Um, so the, the yellow are neutral, and then there's two and a half who are actively disengaged, who they are working against the thing that you are working for. Right? That's what this number is. This is the number of people in your organization who are currently looking for a new job. <laughs> 
51%. There are more people at your job looking for new jobs than there are looking to stay at your job. Um, these are numbers from Gallup poll. Um, we can definitely talk about them, but this is, I, we put these numbers in to make the, I, I'm very big on the moral argument for equity, diversity, inclusion. It's the right thing to do, so we should do it, period. Black Lives Matter because they do, the end. Um, however, it's helpful to know that it is also, in fact, the organizationally sound argument because if half of the people in your organization are looking to leave anyway, how do you take care of them so that they stay? Something that um, Tim Marcio likes to put in, he has a comic that says, um, what if we invest in people and they leave? And then the other says, but what if we don't and they stay? <laughs> right, and that is kind of what you're dealing with. You're dealing with this idea of the people who work for you are people and they have needs and identities and support that is necessary for them to be good people and for them to support the work of your organization, right? And the numbers show that people don't necessarily tell you that they are unhappy. They leave. Sometimes they do. The person who tells you, I want to work with you on this, is engaged <laughs> with you, who says, I want to help. But most people will just show up that those, the, those yellow people in particular will show up, do the bare minimum they need to do to get to the place that they actually will feel taken care of. So if somebody is coming to you saying that this is something they want to work on, they care, which might mean that they, if, if you're one person who cares, they may be that other half person who cares, and that <laughs> is important to think about. Ultimately, work shouldn't suck, <laughs> right? That's not, I don't think that that's that complicated. We spend a lot of time at work. And we, we may even spend more time working than we do at, physically at work, right? We invest a lot of ourselves into it, so the idea that work should suck, that like part of it is just like what we do, is something that I don't really accept anymore um, because we, we can be doing good. We can be doing wonderful things and taking care of ourselves at the same time. We are just as valuable as the people we're supposed to serve. So the idea that work has to suck to be effective actually for me means that you don't know how to execute your mission. Because if you don't know how to do the work you do without burning through the people who do it, then you don't actually know how to do the work you do. Also, misperception is perception. So frequently, the pushback around this thing is not my organization, right? People love where I work, right? People love what we do. Nobody has any of these types of issues. 51% of the people in my organization are not looking for another job. I know that. Okay, um, but again, people aren't going to tell you they are unhappy. And you may not think you have a equity or diversity problem, you may not think that there is racism or sexism or transphobia or homophobia present in your organization, but the math shows that there is somebody experiencing that, and if, they, if there is one person experiencing it, that perception, that misperception, is perception. That is real. You not seeing it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. So knowing that, like, you can say our organization isn't racist, um, but if somebody's like, yeah, except for these people said these racist things to me, <laughs> that is that their quote unquote misperception there under is is real and valid and is the perception. Um, I also offered, just in case you haven't figured out, I clearly have an agenda around this. Oppression is not really the cost of doing business. Um, it just isn't. We we tend to we tend to support the status quo because it's the status quo. Like that's it. That's what it does. Um, and we tend to accept that, uh, well, we just kind of have to be oppressive. It's just how we do things. It's just what happens and like changing it is um, you know, so impossible that we just, we don't know how to do it. And especially if we don't know how to do it right, if we don't do it the way that fixes it, then we don't really do it at all. Um, I always like to say that you know, people have this mis a misperception that the, the progress or that anti-racism is a, is a train moving forward. And if we can just get the train to get to all the places, right, we will, we will have arrived somehow. And my 
metaphor, the metaphor I prefer, is that racism, oppression, is the train. That is the, that is the train, and all we can do is throw everything in front of it to stop it. But it will, if we do nothing, it will keep going. Right, it is, and so your job is to throw, you can throw a building at it, that's fine, but throw sticks, throw stones, throw whatever to stop oppression. Any, any little thing can be helpful, but accepting that oppression is just the cost of doing business, that the, train, that the train is just gonna go regardless of what we throw at it, um, is allowing oppression, racism, every type of, of negativity to continue to prosper. Um, so, why Fractured Atlas? We talked about like why this work, right? Gave you the business case, gave you the emotional case. Why does Fractured Atlas do this? Why us? Um, and the simple answer is because we did some stuff. The end. <laughs> we did some things that had impact. Um, I want to be very clear. We are not saying that these are the things you have to do. Um, these, these are. These are not even the things that we would necessarily do again now, right? Um, it's based on where we were, based on the resources we had. We made some things, made some decisions, impacted some change, and are continuing to commit to iterate and make more things happen. That's what I say. Embrace challenge, make it happen. Those are those are two of our values. Um, yeah, we made changes that had impact. Like, well, ultimately, that's the beginning and end of the story. We're gonna keep talking though. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, like, I like it, I said that? Good. Um, but this is just, uh, just to say some of the things that we did from 2012 to 2017. Um, so we went from 0% leadership uh, in women of color, in, uh, person of color leadership to 50%. Lauren, let's talk. Yeah. <laughs> Lauren and, um, and Polly are gonna talk a little bit about our shared leadership structure, how that changed. Um, but we went from a staff that was 10% people of color to 40% people of color. Um, we went from 5% to 35% fully remote staff. And we went from zero to 60% women software engineers. So it's, stuff can change, right? We can, we can have impact. Um, and frequently another kind of pushback conversation is that well, we won't be able to make change quickly enough, right? And five years in, in an organization is fairly quick, especially to make changes like this. Um, and so it, you're gonna be forever iterating. Again, if you're, th you're throwing anything at the train, it's valuable. So knowing that, make little changes. So we're gonna go on what, what did we do? This is definitely where we can talk some more about specific initiatives. So I'm happy to hear feedback, happy to hear thoughts. Um, but we're gonna go through what we did. Uh, so the first thing we did was we created a staff baseline. And by that I mean we created a staff baseline for information. For, for understanding racism, anti-oppression, how we're going to work through it. Um, go to the timeline. So uh, this is about three to five years of work um, in that. It started with two uh, people on staff going to our people, the People's Institute training for um, anti-racism and beyond. Um, and then there was, we had a task force of staff who was focused on diversity as an issue and, and just getting better understanding of how we could fit. Um, then our entire leadership team at the time went through the People's Institute tra training um, in different locations. They all went based on where they lived because there was a variety of people who were also remote. Um, then we had all staff trainings uh, with uh, Wai Hang Hong, an independent consultant uh, around that where we had where we closed the office for, for three days over a year to really talk and work through these issues. Um, and then we had um, additional all staff training for two days with uh, Karen McCord and the equity quotient team. Um, so we, we made it a point to invest in these conversations by closing, oops, by closing the, the organization and focus on having this internal work. We made it a part of, of how we talk about everything <laughs> for a variety of, of, in a variety of ways. Um, but it, we really wanted to make sure that we weren't just throwing information at people. We gave a variety of ways to engage. Um, it also is part of our uh, intake, our core curriculum. So when people, new people are trained, 
they go through our history. They don't. They, they can't. You know, we can't take them back in time to the staff trainings, but we can provide. These are the takeaways. These are the resources we've brought. These are the ways in which you can engage, and this is also the way we're going to continue this training in a different way. But we, we make sure people are starting with a base of knowledge and conversation. <laughs> um, we've altered our hiring practices um, in a variety of, of ways. Go to the list. Um, so one, we anonymize hiring, right? Um, in that we, there's a, a service I believe we use that can help remove like names and addresses and information before you're looking at resumes and cover letters. Um, we also removed our education requirements. Um, we, we got rid of the requirement for a bachelor's degree because a bachelor's degree is a, is a proxy for a set of skills you want, right? What we had to do was get better at assessing the skills we wanted um, because there are ways in which just you know, getting a bachelor's is, is its own barrier, um, but there are many ways to gather the skills we need that aren't a bachelor's degree or a, a degree of a particular type. And so we had to focus on, as opposed to just using like this degree will equal this amount of skills, we had to really create new ways to assess what are the skills we actually need. Um, structured interviews, which means that we ask um, every candidate for a position the same questions in the same order. Um, so that we aren't just rewarding people who are great storytellers, which you know, is something I've, I've benefited, from, benefited from once or twice. Mm -hmm. uh, but we aren't just rewarding people who are great storytellers, we, we again are assessing skills, right? If storytelling is the skill, then sure, we can, we can do something about that. But frequently, interviews are biased toward people who can talk about what they do more so than do the thing they do. And there are ways in which structured interviews can balance that a bit can say, well, how do we, if we know we are asking these questions in this order, um, how can we compare apples to apples? It also um, minimizes the bias, the kind of interviewer bias. Because how many, how many people have been in an interview that went well because you connected with the person who was interviewing you, right? We got a conversation, we just, you know, in some ways forgot about the questions. We were like, we were just riffing, right? But what that tends to reward are people who are similar to the interviewer. Right? There, it tends to pull in people like you, and that, that creates more shared identity space than shared purpose space. Um, uh, we train more staff to hire an interview, right? So, so also to minimize that, more people are involved in the process. Um, and we share all of our area uh, initiatives up front. Like we have community guidelines, which I'll talk a little bit more about. There are a lot of ways in which um, we were very upfront about this is a part of how we operate. Do you engage? And more and more people are coming to us saying, I heard this is how you operate and are prepared to have this conversation. And to be specific, we've actually added questions to our interview process about um, folks' commitment and understanding of anti-racist and anti-oppression, which is really telling. We get some really interesting answers. Um, we developed a shared leadership structure of which Lauren Ruffin is a part, so I will let her talk oh, about yeah. it. Um, so we no longer, um, Adam Butler, our founder and CEO, left um, earlier this year. Um, and rather than hire a new CEO, the four, there are four of us now on a shared leadership team, um, which really allows for a diversity of opinions. We are um, four very different people. Um, but we are now in a shared decision-making process with each other, um, and we spend a lot of time building team that way. Um, but having four different opinions and four different perspectives actually makes us so much stronger than we would be if we had just had a CEO. Um, and it's, it's really been a great way for, I think, um, information to bubble up from various parts of the organization, um, just by virtue of the fact that there is no sort of one-stop shop at the top. Um, and and that's, been like, that's been really transformational, I think, for how we operate. Um, and I think for how um, our junior staff members see the organization um, and feel like um, they're able to access just the information that we have. Um, and figuring out how do you work together collaboratively to come towards some really big decisions um, for the organization. I will also say it's, it's really helpful to watch our leadership team engage in conflict. Um, so it, it, <laughs> in, in a way, it's, it's very positive, but like there is never, um, 
things are definitely presented as like this is what we've come to, but it's never like well we anonymously not anon we unanimously excuse me decided that this is the thing and we're not going to tell you what the like journey was to get there. It can be like all right, I was for this, he was for this more. We she was undecided and we, like and this is how we got here. This is how we want to implement it. Um, but it has been helpful to watch the model healthy conflict where everybody can be present and say this is what. I, this is where I think this will work, and this is where I think it won't. Um, and then watch that, watch things progress. Yeah, and I would also say, so we have the helmet up there. Um, we spent a lot of time thinking about the military and how your current structure of having a CEO at the top is um, derived from folks who were managing you know, 5,000 troops at a time. Most nonprofits don't actually need that. Um, you're not managing that many people or really complicated processes like that. So why do we hold on to this notion of one person at the top? Um, and it's really about white supremacy and control. Um, so we really began to unpack that, uh, and we make, we make decisions really quickly. Um, and because we like each other and trust each other so much, I know Tim's watching, hi Tim. Um, <laughs> but we like, like, you can have people who are polar opposites in terms of like both style, function, and understanding. Um, but we're able to just sort of directly say like, is that really what you think? Um, is that really what you like, how you feel? And it's like, yes or no, and then I say, okay, cool. Well, we're rolling with it, because I trust you. Um, so. It's a really interesting model that I think more nonprofits should think about. Um, and of course, you know, in the art sector, there are plenty of sort of co-directors, artistic director, managing director models, which is a shared leadership model I think folks don't think about. And in the educational sector, you know, you have co-principals, um, yeah. one person managing academics and another person sort of managing operations at the school. So, um, but it really works for us. I'll also offer the leadership team, they, they have a weekly tactical, the notes from that tactical. Are they, still, are they still transparent? It's funny, I, I can't remember. I think so. I think so. Um, but they used to email the, the, the notes from that tactical to the entire staff. So while they could have you know, leadership conversations that did require confidentiality and, and were there, like the notes from it, we, and we could ask, we could say, this is what, what, what did this thing mean? You know, what, what are you all talking about? And, and it, it was a way to balance them needing to make conversation, have a conversations that you know didn't necessarily involve the whole staff, but the staff also being able to at least see like what was on the docket, what was what was being talked about, what's up, what you know what's what is what is on their radar, and how can we engage with them? Um, crafting community guidelines. Uh, what we what we did was said this is this is what we believe in. Um, if you go to the word cloud, this is a, a word cloud of our community guidelines. You can find them on our website. But uh, this is to show that we really are talking about oppression. We're talking about the individual. We're talking about treatment. Like it, This is a, a highlight for us, what we are emphasizing, what we are talking about. And by making this um, on our, uh, our membership sign up, you need this before you can uh, apply for fiscal sponsorship. You, you have to acknowledge and, and read <laughs> these things to be in community with us. Um, and the partner of this um, is we also have a, a committee that reviews people who may be violating our guidelines, um, which has been an interesting, um, an interesting turn <laughs> for us. Um, but there have been projects that we feel have been operating um, in ways that are, that are hurtful or harmful or irresponsibly. And the, we have a report form where staff or members, community members, any, anybody can actually access the form to file a complaint and say, this is how I think this project is being harmful um, or oppressive. We have a review process that is also transparent. Um, at the very least, it is transparent internally. All of our, um, uh, we, we have a, a full process that our whole staff is aware of. Uh, but the idea is, I'm, I'm a big, I'm a believer in the idea of good fences build good neighbors in the sense that you need to, you need to show people how to treat you, right? And we can't say that we are anti-racist and anti-oppressive um, if we are continuing to support and resource work that is such, and if we aren't giving people the opportunity to call out having been harmed. Can you talk about who's on that committee? Um, sure. Um, <laughs> Well, we make it a point to, it's, it, is, it is staff from all levels of the organization. Um, at any given point, it's between, uh, I think it's five to seven, but we want it to people represent each sector, sector of the committee. There is a guaranteed leadership team member on the committee. Um, but part of the reason why we don't specifically name who was on the committee is so that one, the organization itself 
does take responsibility for for the the calls of the committee. That's why we have a transparent process so everybody knows how we got to where we got to. But um, we want to make sure that people who serve on the committee aren't um, in any way singled out for for harm or retaliation based on a negative response or reaction. Um, but yeah, you may get appointed, but everybody has the opportunity to serve. Um, and it is definitely a, a mix of everyone from the organization in a variety of capacities. Um, this is one of my personal favorites, um, not just because I manage one of the caucuses, but we provided race-based caucusing. So we have monthly meetings of people of color and white people separately in their own space to work out whatever they may need to work out. Um, they are equally resourced in that if one caucus is given funds to do a thing, the other caucus is also provided those funds, but not necessarily do the same thing because people of color need different things than white people in this space. White people need the space with other white people to do the work around whiteness in this, that, that is necessary. People of color need to space to be free from whiteness to navigate just being people of color. The more work I, I manage, clearly the, the person of color caucus. And I like to say my favorite thing is the more work I see the white caucus doing, the less work the POC caucus can do, needs to be doing. It is a space for us to be protected, taken care of, and, and cared for. Um, there are four agenda items on the POC caucus list, and they are, they are check-in, activity, we may have, if we have like a guest, if we want a guest, and then the last one that is frequently the first item to re be removed is our, our questions or responses from the White Caucus. Um, because we need that space to be a POC-based space. Yeah, we'll one more, just a little. Uh, and yes, prioritizing really equity over fairness. So the White Caucus uh, paid a facilitator to help navigate, um, to provide resources, to provide work, like they had homework. It was a very active space. We and the POC Caucus did not need that facilitator. But the amount of money that was paid to the facilitator was also allocated to the POC caucus. Um, the other option, the, not the other the kind of guideline around that is that the white caucus has to report to the POC caucus. So whatever they do monthly, they have, to, they have to come back. We have a liaison who tells me and the, the other caucus members what is happening, but they, their notes that are sent to us, they are anonymized, so you don't have to attach anything to a particular person. But again, what they worked on goes to the POC caucus. The POC caucus can share what they want with the white caucus, but do not have to. Um, and again, this is about, in some ways, correcting other imbalances, but also recognizing that the work of, of racism specifically requires white people to do work with other white people. And it requires self-care for people of color in what can be hostile spaces. This is often where people have questions or pushback. I might have lost some of you, so I'm, I'm, I'm open for it. Yes? I have a question. Yes. Uh, in the caucusing, do you uh, create the, the difference between whites and people of color based on how they identify or how they are identified? That is a very good question. Did everybody hear it? Um, okay, so the, the question was, do we uh, create like affiliations in the caucus based on how the person identifies or how like they are externally identified, I guess, by the organization? That is a great question. Um, it is how the person identifies, um, the way, it, the way we do it is um, we present what caucusing is and its purpose for um, in our core curriculum, in our orientation, our training, and we just issue invitations. They are voluntary, um, so we issue invitations and just say, if you would like to join the White Caucus, this is who you can speak with. If you would like to join the Person of Color Caucus, this is who you can speak with. Um, 
we have been known to reissue invitations. <laughs> Just to say, I, you, this space may be of value to you. Um, but it is always about how people wish to participate. And we have had people, multiracial people, join caucuses um, based on where they were. That's always fun. <laughs> people are like ethnically ambiguous. You're like, so which way are you going? <laughs> yeah. We're all like, kind of, which way is it going? It's like, yeah, POC caucus. <laughs> <laughs> she always so excited. It's always just welcome. To, to see, um, you know, somebody's like drafting for dodgeball. Like, yes, yeah. where, yeah. where, where are you going? Where are you going? <laughs> um, but it is uh, one. More and more people are excited to be a part of, of either space, right? Is there's definitely um, again different like social impacts. But I will say, uh, as a person of color, it is beautiful to know that the white people have a place to work on this stuff. Like it is, I cannot stress enough how glorious it is because the conversations we've been able to have as a result are amazing because they've done the work. They aren't coming to me or any other person of color asking for labor. It is about, now it's a conversation. Now, now you, aren't, you aren't asking me to do work for you. You've done the work. Now you want to talk about like what does this mean? How do we implement this? And that is glorious. Yes. When you say asking you to do the work, can you give us an example of what it means? Well, yes. Um, without like giving specific examples, but like a common conversation as a woman of color is where somebody presents to you, just how do you feel about Barack Obama? As a question, is actually a question that requires work <laughs> because oftentimes when a white person is asking that question, particularly unprompted. <laughs> right, it was out of nowhere. It's the the implications behind that question are are one you have to justify whatever position you have on this person. You, you don't even necessarily know why. Like there's a feeling that they've been having a conversation with you that you haven't been in, and so now you also have to catch up. That's labor. <laughs> You're like, where are we? I thought we were. There's coffee. I don't understand <laughs> how we got here. Um, and then if you may say something that they disagree with. You know, there is a concept, white fragility, where all of a sudden now you are an aggressor, right? So you spend time trying not to be the aggressor for a conversation that you did not start, right? That is labor. <laughs> that, that, is, that is labor because this one question has prompted a series of thoughts and work and deciphering that you have to do. And, and I won't, you know, I don't, I don't want to speak for anybody, but that is a way that has happened for me. Now the conversation is, is not just this big open question that requires you to defend a thing that you didn't even know you had to defend. Now it's an actual conversation about an issue. Or it's a conversation with you as an equal. Where it's like, this, I saw this thing and I had these feelings. Can we talk about, did I miss something? Can we have an, I would like a better understanding. I now understand that this may have not been an okay interaction we had. Can we talk about it? Um, which again, invites somebody in as opposed to making them do the work to deal with whatever feelings you're having. Is that, is that more clear? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you. Yes? So how do you ensure that uh, sense of vulnerability or allow for that uh, sense of vulnerability in or in these caucuses? Because I imagine people still bring their titles Oh, yeah. still bring, and, I, and I can see how it can be more effective in a flat organization, but in a very hierarchical organization, how are these caucuses set up so that an individual would feel comfortable to disagree with, say, uh, senior leadership? Um, I mean, part of it is, is the way in which conflict permeates our organization, like being able to have healthy, that's why I said watching the leadership team engage in healthy conflict, um, is a great way for all of us to be able to engage in healthy conflict. Um, yeah, I was gonna say, I think, I think it, it starts well before you enter a caucus room. Um, I always feel like in POC caucus, I'm, I'm very clear about like, I'm taking my leadership hat off and I'm just a tired black woman right here. <laughs> you know, like, it's not there. However, if you have questions that relate to leadership, I can say I'll put my leadership back on and I can provide clarity, explanation, whatever. Um, and of course, confidentiality abounds in those spaces. 
Um, but I don't think we've had, I can't speak for the White Caucus, um, I haven't heard anything um, with regard to sort of titles, but we're not a super hierarchical organization. Right. Um, and I do think we model that on the leadership team, that like we want people's opinions and perspectives, um, and we don't want anyone to feel like they're gonna be penalized um, for having a thought. Um, that's not what it's about. Yeah, and there have also been moments where leadership has, like just through schedules or whatever, leadership team isn't always present at every caucus. You know, so sometimes if there are spaces where and the great thing is also there are people of color and white people at every level of the organization, so information can travel. Um, but it, it always travels with like respect and, and confidentiality is important. We, we are very big on like what's learned here leaves here, but what's said here stays here. So we've had some really great lessons leave the space, but it's never like so-and-so said this. Um, and yes, leadership team, Lauren and, and Palomi, our uh, CPO, are, are very good at, at kind of identifying, at least changing like what hats they're wearing or what the context is around it. Yeah, and we try to, I mean, Palomi and I try to make sure one of us is there, mostly because um, questions come up that are, you know, salary questions, or, you know, what's, what's the sort of direction of the organization, so it's important for one of us to be there just to answer those clarifying questions. But I've always felt like folks were very, open about, you know, for bitching if there's something happening. Right. Um, and that's cool. I mean, that's what the space is for. Yeah. And the, the check-in is the, for the POC caucus, the check-in is the, can be the whole caucus. When you bring your feeling, whatever you're talking about. So sometimes it, we just go around the room. It's like, all right, well, we just, we, we all dealt with that. And then, and then we're done for the day. Um, and one of my kind of greatest moments when I felt like it was just really working was when people started really asking, like, when is the caucus? When do I get to go there? When do we get to be in this space again? Because um, it shows that it's necessary, and sometimes it feels like we're just hanging around and having a good time, and that's, but that's, that's the point. That is both the, the, the way it feels and the, the point to be a space where you can just be in. Um, we also joke that we do have the unofficial POC caucus, and that's the hour where the white people are having their white caucus. Like, all of a sudden, they disappear. <laughs> it's just kind of fascinating. We're like, oh, wait, this is, we are here in the, in a, in the unofficial caucus. Yes. Um, I think we saw, we had a couple of other questions yes. there. Sorry, time Um, yeah, I'm curious how how big is your staff, and I'm I'm getting the drift that participation is voluntary in these caucuses. Is that correct? And if so, like, have you seen? Like, like, have you seen like rough percentage? I'm just curious, like, what percentage of staff is participating, and has that grown over time? And do people have to go, like, do people come in and out just depending upon their schedules, or is it really like if you're participating in the caucus, you're making those monthly meetings and they're prioritized as such? So our staff is um, roughly 35 folks from all over the country. Um, this is like a question that gets really sticky um, because the caucus is a very different purposes, um, and. We all have schedules, you know, but you do find white people avoiding the white caucus because they don't want to do the work. I mean, that's just fundamentally, you know, we were talking earlier, like there's research that says white people hate being called white, being in white spaces, you live in white spaces all the time. Um, you don't have any black friends, no friends of color. So you're effectively living a white caucus your entire life. Um, but if you do it in the workplace, um, and the typical pushback is, you know, from white women is why don't we have a women's caucus? Um, you know, my gender is oppressed, so I'm not going to the white people caucus and we can't have a gender caucus. Um, and I use words that are very strong about that, which is this person's fundamentally sabotaging um, any effort you have to get rid of oppression. Um, and we have had staff members who said they weren't going, and my colleagues and I have had frank conversations about the fact that it's been mandatory, because those are people who need to do the most work. Um, and those are the folks who were having random conversations about, you know, did, you know, well, I voted for Hillary. I didn't ask you who you voted for. <laughs> you know, like, why are we talking about that? So you need to go to White Caucus. Um, but so, um, we don't have, it's not mandatory attendance, but, you know, at some point, you have to kind of challenge people on, like, are you really committed to this work that we're doing? We've been transparent about where we're going. And either you're on board or you're not. Um, and if you're not, this might not be the right place for you. Um, and that's a hard conversation to have. Um, with people, and but it has to happen. So okay. that's a good question. Yeah. yeah. I'd like to pick up that a little bit more. So if you do, you, do you have the capability, I would assume, to make it mandatory? You couldn't make that decision. 
we and I understand yeah. that these are two different organizations with different purposes, but specifically for the White Caucus, mm -hmm. would you see benefit structurally in making that a mandatory requirement of employment? You know, I, this is my personal opinion. Um, I don't think it should be mandatory, but I think you can tell a lot about someone's commitment based on how they spend their time and how they prioritize their time. Um, and so it's all, you're, you're always, as, as you know, someone in leadership, you're always gathering information. Um, and that's just information. Like if, you've, if you find out you're not really working on anything, you just don't wanna go. Or again, like it's, um, the, the, the point about like, well, we have this caucus, why don't we have this one? Is really a way of undermining the fact that you actually think racism and white supremacy isn't a real thing. Um, and that's just what it is. You're just using coding language and I know what that is. So I, I don't think it should be mandatory. It's all just information. I also, um, to support that, is that the choice to engage in the work is actually, I think, one of the hardest mm -hmm. parts of the work. There are a variety of things that are difficult, but forcing, I think forcing particularly white people to engage in the work is just a, a means to create microaggressions, is a means to create resentment, and is a means for them to sabotage the space. Mm -hmm. Um, so mandatory, making it mandatory will also allow many a wolf in sheep's clothing to show up because they have to be there and they have to be present. And I would much rather somebody who is not ready, willing, or able to engage in this work to be able to opt out so that I can, I can know where we stand around, yeah. around how, around our shared purpose. I think there's another, um, Tani Lisi Coates for a great piece. I'm, Plus minus on him a lot of time, but he wrote a piece about like knowing your whites. Um, did you have you read it? Yes. And I think about it a lot as we're getting into this conversation about white caucus and how people are choosing to spend their time. People of color because have had to pay a lot of attention to white people to survive in this country. Like we pay attention to everything. And so, especially if you have young staff members of color, they're trying to figure out are they safe in the space that you created for them. So if they see people not going to white caucus, they're constantly paying attention to that. So like, it's not flying under the radar because survival has like taught us through generations that we have to know exactly where our white colleagues are, where our white neighbors are, what they're doing, how they're spending their time. Um, and I, it's a great piece. Um, I, I need to just read it because um, it, it it's really just good to think about. Um, spend time thinking about what you're projecting out into the world. Um, and I think a lot of people don't do that. Yes. Um, is this so when when people are let's say coming to apply for a job at Dr. Atlas, is all of this um, pretty sort of straightforward and transparent to them at that time? Yep. So that there is shouldn't be any issue moving forward. Yes. It's actually transparent to everyone. If you go to howwework.fracturedatlas.org, we have a list of our policies as well as our caucusing, our area. Like you can go. Anybody who's at, we, and I believe we list it in the job, um, in job descriptions or job applications, go to this site to see how we work. Um, so yes, we try to we make it clear in a variety of spaces. Yes. That helps to clarify part of my question. But another question, in essence though, aren't you saying it's mandatory though if you say uh, that if this isn't something you're not, if this is something you're not interested in, then maybe this is not the place for you? that creates a sort of back door to saying you, you either belong or you don't belong here based on this non-mandatory perceived I mean, policy. How do, you, how do you deal with the, have you had any questioning around that? And for the folks who were the folks, were there folks who were at the organization before the, the policy came into effect? Um, left. You want me to take it? I, I mean, I have, I have thoughts. <laughs> 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 you go, I would like. I mean, I would like to, and I, I'm going to own this. This is not crafted out. This is Courtney speaking. If you do not want to work on anti-racism, I do not want to work with you. <laughs> we are <laughs> right. I'm not, and then I am not. That is not crafted out. Speaking again. That is Courtney Alicia Hart saying. This is how I feel about it. That's the middle name. Yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> but and and. I, part of the reason I work for Fractured Atlas is they took a stand saying, this is what we do. We are an arts organization, however, we are committed to anti-racism. Nobody is required to work here, right? So if you want to work for us, 
anti-racism is a part of what you do. It, and, and we are, again, very transparent about that in a variety of spaces. So coming in and then being upset or averse to working on anti-racism is, I, I don't, I, it, it is, it's, a whole bunch of like their problem that I <laughs> that I can't I can't relate to because part of why I thrive in this space is being able to do this work. Yeah, um, I would I would add um, uh, there are things that we can negotiate around, but people's humanity is not one of them. Mm -hmm. And so this feels solidly in the humanity the, the, the humanity category um, in a way that where you went to did you go to Harvard or Yale does not. Um, and so they're just some things that we're not gonna negotiate around. Um, back to the question about interviewing, um, we ask people basic, you know, how do you, what do you think diversity is? You know, how have you actively done this in your life? Um, and there have been times where um, we have hired someone and I've been like, this isn't gonna work. Like you, you decided to treat that and, and it's been interesting working with my colleagues and leadership team as, as they try to figure out how do you assess someone's fit with regard to this particular area, not anything else. Um, but the folks that give kind of shitty answers to that question, because this is basic, it's 2018, everybody's talking about race, do some reading, this is like not hard. We're in New York, we can't find people in New York who can understand diversity, equity, and like oppression at this point. But we hire people sometimes for some roles. And I know like within the first two weeks, I have an interaction like this isn't gonna work. And typically it's, it's, um, it's because the folks who have stayed in the organization, people are committed there, um, I worked for this woman a long time ago, and I remember my interview, I said, you know, tell me about your culture. And she said, I can't describe culture. Um, as a leader, you shouldn't necessarily have to describe culture. She said, but our culture is so tight that I don't have to tell people, I'm not the one who decides when someone's not a good fit. The culture pushes the person out like a bad tooth. And I was like, ooh, like a bad tooth. That is a, that's, that's, that's like, yeah, and I will never forget that. But on this particular issue, we're almost at the point where um, colleagues will come to to a manager and say this person might not be a good fit, and that's how and that's how you know that and that's not you know that's not shared identity. Our purpose at this point is being anti is being anti racist anti -racist, actively, um, and there are people who have left, and they, it wasn't a good fit. Yeah. Okay, just to follow up on that. Okay. So the people who have left were they pushed out like a bad tooth? Or did they choose to extract themselves as a two? I think it kind of happened at the same time. <laughs> yeah, and was there, and how, how are you guys functioning around the HR issues or challenges around that? Um, I mean, there was a point where we had a fair amount of turnover related to just the nature of, when I started at Fractured Atlas, I think our average tenure was like more than five years. And we had a really young staff, and I remember saying, that's a long time for someone to stay in like their first job. Mm -hmm. um, and so part of it, I think, was just cyclical. Um, but again, like these are the HR issues just like any other ones. We have a really good staff. Um, and the folks who left just were folks who said essentially, like, I signed up to work for an arts organization, not like the ACLU, you know? Like, and that's, you get to make that choice. Um, and people, and it's, it's, you know, we don't, to, the, to continue the tooth metaphor, but we don't like, we don't like send anybody to the city limits. Like we aren't tarring and feathering anyone, you know? We are, like, it's not, it's not, a, it's not in any way a violent exodus. But people <laughs> prioritize differently, and you just find that you're having conversations. And that is also the down, not downside, but it's the other side to this work. You're going to lose good people who don't wish to fight the good fight. Did we talk about compensation in this? I don't think so. Okay. So the other, so part of our commitment to equity is around our, our compensation model. Um, so everybody at every tier gets paid the same. Um, and there are, and that's, you know, we all know there are certain groups, women and people of color, who don't negotiate salary, um, or, or who are actively lied to. Or who are, yes, exactly. So yes. for years we've had a flat tier um, structure. We've just made some changes, so now there are two steps in the tier, but we advertise your salary when you start. We don't negotiate on it. This is just like, if you're interested in the job, this is what we pay you. Um, everything's transparent um, with our shared leadership team. Um, when we, you know, up in, you know, when we were, um, prior to moving to a shared leadership team, we all had different salary levels, now we're all at the same level. Um, and that becomes very hard for folks to stick with because they don't understand that our salary structure and the way that compensation works is actually tied to our commitment to equity. 
Um, and that tends to be, there are folks who come in who um, feel like they should have make more money, they were upset they couldn't negotiate um, you know, during the interview and hiring process, um, and it comes up with sort of repeated, um, it's, it's weird, people asking for salary increases a lot, um, which I've never had have an organization outside of like an evaluation structure. Um, it's very weird, just really has someone asking for more money. Um, <laughs> but after they sort of bump up against that, oh, you guys are serious about this compensation thing, um, that's another reason why folks tend to transition out. They want they want more money, they think they're worth more, and they don't understand that, they, that we don't negotiate on salary. Was there another question over here? I'll make sure I'm not. Oh, I, but I think there's okay, one we'll go here and then come back. Um, so just a uh, practical question for the caucuses. Okay. Um, sorry, it's a practical question for the caucuses. Um, so you have 35% of folks who are working remotely. Um, how do you manage that space? I've had remote workers, you know, even just having a regular meeting with remote workers can be, you know, on both sides, it's easy to disengage or forget about the person on the phone or the person on the phone, like, you know, puts it on mute and just kind of hangs out. So how do you manage those spaces with that kind of dynamic? I think this goes back to the, or the earlier answer about like how do we create the safe spaces, that there are ways in which it permeates the organization. Like we're, we're getting very close and we aren't at actually like 50 to almost 60% remote at this point. So our organization is built to include remote workers, just like how we operate in general. So having video, having video chat is, is helpful. But like, really, I'm full-time remote, I live in Albuquerque and um, I'm on video all day long. Yeah. So like it, our our work our work culture just includes this idea that like we are making space for people on on video chat. We've done we, we did our training um, with video chat and we you know used made sure to use the like individual um, the breakout group session and Zoom and like we you know we we make it a point to use our technology to create equitable spaces by acknowledging that we have people there. But um, we've, we tried to do an outing and like want to see, okay, what can we do? How can we use some of our funding to like get the people who are remote in? Like how can we support that and not make it an additional burden? There are a variety of ways in which we try to engage with that. But yeah. So Kita, I didn't mean to thank you. Two, two thoughts, I guess. One is that you have the caucus spaces and those are voluntary. But you also do two or three trainings a year and those are not. Correct. Right. So it's not like they can totally opt out. It's just that they're opting out of the voluntary portion. Correct. Yeah. And I don't think, I mean, I should say, we don't have a problem people opting out at this point. I think they've become, um, for a while our White Caucus was just, there was no one leading it. Um, no one really felt like they were advanced enough in terms of like their own personal education to lead it. So we brought a facilitator to do that and attendance went up. You know, for a while people said this is a waste of time and it might have been. Um, so I, I think, again, we're at the point as it took a while to get there, um, maybe 18 months. Um, but for the most part, I don't think we have an issue with mandatory. I mean, you have to make it worthwhile for folks. Yes. And then the second part of that is you say you have a flat uh, compensation, um, how are you determining what that compensation level is? Yeah, so several years ago we did a salary, we had we brought a consultant to a salary study, um, so it's all pegged to market. Um, I mean, I think we are very competitive with sort of the sector that we're in. Um, and yeah, we, you know, step increases with COLA and, you know, various sort of regulations, but um, I think our starting salary now is at 48. Um, and so, it's, we're competitive with the market. And there's also, um, I want to offer their our, our benefits that uh, just kind of support the whole person. So we have everybody has a thousand dollars professional development to use a year. We have uh, three hundred fifty dollars in what we call our ticket allowance, so that is to go see the work of people in our communities. We have we have unlimited vacation days, um, which means if you are delivering the things, this is one of the joys of shared purpose. If you complete the purpose, you can go home, um, <laughs> which is nice. Um, and so we have a lot of. It, it, uh, I love that I can talk to leadership and say, this is the thing I need to take care of myself in service of the work in that conversation. Is, and that's enough reason to not have to be at work. <laughs> you know, like that is, the, and, and that becomes something that it is both about equity and it's about being able to be present and have very honest conversations about like what it means to, to be somebody at a job somewhere. 
Don't quote me on that salary. Now I'm seeing like, is, do we spend 48? I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I, don't yeah. I just hire people and I don't know what we offer. Yeah, but we do. Exactly. It's, it's, um, but it is, it is, it is transparent. Is, is everybody at a level makes a thing and makes the same thing and you can, there are conversations about that, but yeah. Should we, should we try to, we have a couple more we slides? We have a couple more slides. And so we will we get continue the conversations. Yes. Okay. What time is it? I don't know. 11.15? 11. 11.15? 11. 11. Oh, okay, good. Oh, we're still, we're okay. All right. Develop the negative interactions document. So I, I promise we're going to get back to your questions. There will be more more time for sure. But this is also something that I'm personally really proud of, partially because it came out of the POC caucus. Um, and so this negative interactions document is a means for people dealing with negative interactions. We have a majority of we have a majority of our customer service staff is actually young women of color. Um, and one of the things that I found was happening. And we, we all talked about is that people were staying in terrible conversations for way too long. Um, in a in in this in a sense of um, in a sense of like good customer service, which I personally believe this was one of our unintended core values. And I was I was shocked when I was like, why are we staying on the phone with these people? Right. Yeah, but it, right that was it wasn't an unintended core value because people were staying on the phone assuming that. The customer is always right because that is a that is a permeating thing. Um, and I, I remember I had a conversation with Adam before we got to this, and I was like, you know, I've just gotten to a point in my life where I I'm okay with losing my job with somebody if somebody gets inappropriate on the phone. Like I've just like there was a decision I made that like if I have to, that's fine. And he was like, why would you think you need to lose your job? And I was like, because that's on the line based on the way people talk to him. But, but as a white man, it had never occurred to him that a negative phone interaction could result in having to like choose between letting this person speak to me however they want and, and my job. And I, and I was amazed that he was amazed. It was just a moment of, of like, oh, you've never, I've, I've, had, I've worked retail a while, I've worked customer service a while, like I just made a decision that like, there are some things that just weren't gonna happen for me. And I was like, but that required a lot of work required me being in my career for a while and understanding that like there are other jobs. Um, but I'm, I'm not 22 fresh out of college. Like, like I'm not in that same space. And he was like, the, and the conversation just started where like a lot of our younger staff was really like, what makes you, like why would I think that I can get off the phone or that I would be supported in what this person, if, if somebody said something to me and I retaliated or I responded, right? And um, we wanted to create a document that, that created um, options. But my favorite option is that they can hang up the phone. You've given our staff permission with the full backing of the organization to simply hang up on someone. And if you hang up, you're not gonna get quite asked why. No, there, there's no like, well, are you sure you, did you interpret that right? Was it really racist or sexist or? There's none of that. There's none of that. It's what you think it is in the moment. Right. And uh, we also made it a point to you don't have to, we aren't prioritizing any one of these options over another. Because um, there was originally or some preliminary conversations. <laughs> it hang up. And it's like, no, some people have a capacity to engage, some people don't. And, the, and that individual capacity also changes like day by day based on what, what's going on. You can just hang up. We value who you are and the work you do for us more than somebody being racist, sexist, or just outright rude to you on the phone. Like, if we are, we value our staff as members of our community, and if other members of our community are mistreating them, then it is, it is the mistreating member's fault. It is not our staff. Because the additional burden of having to like listen to two people say really oppressive things, and then having to engage, and having to teach them and walk them through and then still provide service is is more work than anybody should be reasonably asked to do. Um, and so this document is almost, it's less in fact about the individual solutions on it. There's nothing on here that is um, revolutionary. It's, these are just ways to engage, but it's more about like this document means explicitly these are the ways the organization will support you in an interaction that is negative and we leave it to the individual to determine there is no racism bar it doesn't have to be x ra this much racist it doesn't have to be this much sexist you know like we there is no proof 
of, there's no burden of proof in this, in this scenario. If this impacted you, you can respond however you wish. Um, <laughs> I learned recently that our uh, CEO does not actually like this slide, but he said I could keep it. Uh, because of human resources, because like the, the, the phrase human resources um, is, is limiting, right? People attach some very specific things to it. Um, but until I find a better way to say this thing, um, this is where we are. But it's it, one of the a core value and, and a kind of a, an understood core value of Fractured Atlas is this. Like human resources are humans first, resources second. That is something that I think really permeates how we operate. You recognize that there are people who work for you. They are not just tools to get something done. These are human beings. And, and being able to start a conversation at work as a human being is a privilege not afforded to too many, frankly. Um, I've been in workplaces where I had to be a worker or an employee first and had to stop being a human being to be able to get something done. And that has been changing. Uh, it's been life changing to experience. Uh, so this is the more fun, more fun part around conversation. What can you do and what do you want to do? Um, so what can you do is uh, one of the things is proactively recruit. If you see people who out in the world who are who you think are aligned with what your organization does, have conversations with them. Like it's very difficult to change an organizational culture if that's something you're looking to do. Um, one person at a time, or just putting an open call out and like hoping that the, the right fish <laughs> bite. You have to see people who are doing the change or impacting the change that you want and seeing if you can have conversations with them, you know. Yes? Um, so I love that. And my question is how can we make sure, how do you make sure that um, white-led organizations or leadership um, don't go around just finding any person of color and just like, hey, you're with it, right? right. Um, how do we make sure that that also I mean, personally, I do like the idea of a, of a, of a future where people are just walking around throwing jobs at people of color. Like, <laughs> like I know that's not the point, but I just like the idea of you, you want to talk, I, I'm totally into it. <laughs> so as a byproduct, I'm like kind of, kind of here yeah. for that. Yeah, we'll have uh, another black president. That's exciting. Right. You're just wrong president. Today, <laughs> so, right. You, right. Yeah. Just so you know, I just love like somebody with like stacks of like ED positions, just like tossing them, out. <laughs> yeah. making it rain jobs. <laughs> that would be ideal. So I know, right? In, you know in the serious, in the seriousness of like this idea of like of tokenizing. Um, there's also this really great article about the, like the life cycle of a, of a a black woman specifically in an organization and the idea how. Frequently, black women are pulled into organizations to change them, and then when they start changing them, they get pushed out. <laughs> um, and so, uh, there's a it, it's some really great research around that. And so, where it, people are pulled into organizations and they're basically asked to fix it, um, but when you fix something, you might lose things, or you have to, you know, change. And then they're like, oh no, we don't want that. We need you to fix that without actually challenging our own racism or institutional policies or, you know, anything. Um, and then they are, you know, their power is generally taken away, and then they're usually upset. Um, there's a life cycle around what, like a year and a half, um, and so we don't want to continue that cycle. Um, so, proactively recruiting is something you can do once you've made sure your environment is safe for people of color. Because I will also say, don't ask people of color to come into your hostile environment. <laughs> like I don't, I don't need that. Right? If, and if you don't want to change, to, to go back to my, like, if this is not the work you want to do, then, frankly, don't. <laughs> Just, like, for real. If there is an ethical cause, reason to be anti-racist, anti-sexist, all of that. But if that's not, if you're not ready to support that, if that's not what you want to do, if you want to continue with business as usual, like, I would much rather you do that and, like, say that. There are people who will work for you. You will continue to thrive, probably, for at least for a little while longer. Maybe after 2020, I'm not 100% sure, but at least for a little bit, you'll still be able to do that. And, and then let people who don't want to be in that environment be elsewhere. But I would also, I want to get into that question because I think it's a really good one. I remember, again, being new to the arts, I kept hearing about this like pipeline problem. Oh. Um, and I was at a, a foundation meeting right after I started, and I just, I just had to say, I think I was quiet the whole day because I didn't know what the hell they were talking about. But um, there is this idea that you have to have a perfect candidate of color. 
Like, folks want people of color to be perfect for them before they hire them, and we'll take any old flawed white person and put them into leadership roles. I know that's hard, but I remember when I was interviewing at Fractured Atlas, you know, they had sort of four things they wanted. I had two of the four sort of overarching qualities, right? I can fundraise, my, you know, watch your wallets. Y'all will find me out $5 before you leave here. I will fundraise, and I'm a solid communicator, and I get policy. But they also wanted someone with like a lot of marketing experience and sort of a, 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 a background in marketing products, tech products specifically. I don't have that. I remember being really clear. I, got, I can figure that stuff out. This is what I do. This is what I don't do. How are you going to support me as an organization and making sure that I can be successful in this role? Because I am not a perfect candidate. Um, and I think that's the hard part, which is not just recruiting, but how do you retain? What does your professional development look like? How are you giving people feedback? Do you give people of color feedback? As a manager, or do you just let them struggle? Word. Because uh. you, you don't want to have a confrontation. But you have to give people constant evaluation and constant feedback, and that's where it gets hard for people of color to thrive in leadership roles. People will just ice them out, and then they'll leave, or you fire them and tell them they want to get culture fit, which is not cool. So I think that's the, that's the underlying point. There are no perfect candidates, but how are you going to support them to make them, if people push your mission as far as you can? Yeah. So the question ties back uh, to your response. Because I've heard kind of like the chicken on the egg, chicken on the egg um, cycle with you need to have a critical mass of um, employees of color to change the organizational culture, but then you also have to have, and then the other argument is the culture needs to be there before you bring in uh, individuals of color. So I'm wondering how do you reconcile that if the organizational culture isn't there, but you don't want to bring uh, other people of color into a hostile environment? I, I want to be clear. I, I'm, I'm not advocating for a critical mass. I am advocating for a non-hostile environment. So, what I, I, maybe contrary to what I've spoken, I believe white people can create a safe environment. <laughs> but one of the things that has to happen in that space is for white people to recognize that they may be in a hostile environment currently. So, there are, and there are definitely, I, I was willing to be one of four for Fractured Atlas because I felt like the environment was safe, and I tested that environment in a variety of ways, <laughs> right? But, but it, it wasn't, so for me, it wasn't about the critical mass of majority staff of color. It was about, have they done the work where this environment is not hostile, or, or are they willing to address the area? If I can point out and say, this section feels a little rough, will they deal with that? And so, I'm not talking about per a perfectly like glorious environment. I'm talking about have you addressed the ways in which your environment could be hostile? And one of the ways to do that in proactive recruiting is to ask that person, or to answer Lauren's question, are, are you willing to give that person what they need to thrive in this space? Right, and if the answer, if you know the answer is no. Then let them be. Or <laughs> how do you, what suggestions do you have to change or start that conversation to change the organizational culture because that uh, I'm speaking from for my or speaking personal and not on my organization but that's what I have experienced in my organization and it's just this oh well we can't do it yet because then it, leadership isn't on board so then it just kind of then it, so then it's yeah that's that's a place to be. Um, <laughs> I mean it's it's it really it's I mean, I know that's that's not helpful. I'm gonna say something that is helpful. Uh, <laughs> but part of it really is like this I, I to go what Lauren said, we don't debate humanity. And if somebody is willing to debate you about your own humanity, they are not ready for you. And you you can't you can't change that. I, and I wish we could, but I've, I've worked in plenty of, of spaces where it's like you are not, if you're still on the fence on whether or not I'm a person, I, I, we, we can't talk anymore. We just, it's just not here. And so everybody then has to make the decision for how much of that they can take. Um, and yes, there's a certain level of dehumanization. Like everybody has to decide what their limits are. And some people can, can compartmentalize in a way that allows them to like be here and do this thing and then go out and like be a person elsewhere. Um, and like want, the, you can want deeply to change a thing, but if somebody is still debating about whether or not you are a person of value, then the debate is actually over. Yeah, and I also think, um, I had a friend who was in a really just difficult work situation, and I finally had to say, you can get another job. 
you are talented, you're brilliant, you work your ass off, go get another job. Anybody would be happy to hire you. And there's a, um, when you find yourself in toxic work situations that are, it's just a cycle of abuse. And I do believe there are abusive work environments. Yes, yes, there are. Um, go get another job. Good people want to continue to invest in those relationships and you can't change everyone. You just can't. So figure out what your own personal level is. And I mean, people have to walk. And staff members will walk. Um, they do. And I think organizations, I, I know organizations lose very talented people of color, very talented um, <laughs> queer people, especially. I would say people of color and queer people who are super talented because they're in a hostile work environment. And no one wants to address the fact because it's good for you, white guy. It's actually straight white man. It's actually terrible for everybody who works for you. Nobody wants to have that conversation. Should we hop to these slides? Yes. I just want to make sure we get through yes, all things. Okay. Um, kill your darlings and admit, admit defeat. So <laughs> one of the ways to um, recognize this and to get people is everybody's like, well, we don't have a capacity. We don't have money. We don't have time. We don't have staff or whatever. I offer, like one of the examples, killing your darlings. And your darling is something that you do well, but nobody is actually benefiting from. Right? Like you, this is where if you're clear on your shared purpose, you can really assess whether or not the things you're doing are, are going for that purpose. And almost every organization has something they do well because they love it and they have the resources and it's fun and people like it and it's not, but it's not actually serving the community that, or it's not actually executing your purpose to be clear. And that is a darling and it, it needs to go. Maybe you can do something like write up the, the model for it, write up how you execute it and give it to somebody else who can do it so it still gets done but maybe that's not what you do, or you can just decide to end it, or there, there are a variety of things. And Fractured Atlas has, has killed a few darlings, right? The other one is admitting defeat. And those are, you admit defeat on the things that are probably serving the people you need to serve that are executing the purpose, but you are not doing well, and or are, know that people are actively doing better. Like, and that's hard. It's like, this is a thing that I know people need, but we're struggling to get through it, or it's just not like, all of our resources are not there, and, and sometimes you just have to admit defeat. We are not doing this. Maybe we can support or amplify somebody else who can do this better. Maybe we can find another way to serve, to accomplish the same goal. But that's, it's, a, it, it's a long, hard conversation about what you're doing. But when you kill your darlings and or admit defeat, what you're also doing is freeing resources staff time, personal time, mental energy, you are, you are actually not doing something to be as impactful as doing something if you are thoughtful and intentional about it. Because when you do that, you can do the next thing, which is build comp competency and partner responsibly. Right? Like, now that you have more money or resources or, or, or space, time, time, anything, um, you can get better at doing something. <laughs> right? And that's what I mean by build competency. You can, if people aren't working 10, 12 hour days to execute this program that you're no longer going to do, or this, this way that you're no longer going to operate, they can also then go to anti-racism trainings. They can go to events like this. They can um, be resourced. You can put in that hour for caucusing once a month. You can make, you can build competency. You can get better at a thing, whatever that is. You can also now partner responsibly. If you know that somebody, something needs to happen and you maybe can't do it yourself, but you know other people just need the, like, the little push you could provide or the support you could provide, like that's how you know what you can do. And you can hold your partners accountable. Um, one of the things I, I like to talk about is our uh, insurance uh, program. We partnered with Locked and Affinity to offer insurance to our uh, projects. Um, and then locked in also partnered with the NRA for a policy we found unethical and problematic. And we held our partner accountable to that, right? We actually on our site had ways in which you could actively protest this policy. We had, we, we for a minute were saying, we have an insurance program that we are advising you to maybe look at other options for. <laughs> um, we were saying like, this is because, because again, we have these values and this is a thing that is not, that's, goes against our values. And they are, they've since ended the policy for a variety of reasons. Um, but we had to know who we were partnering with and we had to know what our values are for that to happen. 
where previously there was a time where we would have just let that partnership like be and not recognize it had a negative impact on our members. Um, but because we had the resources to be aware and, and active in this partnership, we were able to do more. Um, and last is whatever you can. Anything, all of it. Um, if you can, whatever you can throw at the train, throw at it. Um, these are, if you look at the, the next slide, there are, these are four areas in which you can impact change. There are many more. But, um, you know, language and practice, like there are ways that you and as an individual, no matter what power you have in your organization, can make a change. But as an example, adding pronouns to your email signature. It's just a way to normalize the idea of asking for pronouns, right? I doubt you need anybody's permission to update your email signature, but it, it can have an impact. It can let people know that this is a conversation they, they can have. Um, in your practice, like I, like I said, I made the decision that there are some things people just couldn't say to me <laughs> on the phone, right? That is a personal practice. That is something I've not asked anybody permission for, right? Um, so how, how one reacts, is, this is just where it goes. And like, that is a way of being able to impact change because I can have conversations with people who say like, this is how we can interact going forward. Um, then you can get into like full on policies, our community guidelines, is a, you know, and, and having, and the resulting review committee is a policy, right? And then you can make programs, something that says this, how do you actively serve? How do you, how do you, how do you kind of change how you're operating in a way that like operates your programs? Because the majority of things I've talked to you about aren't program related. We didn't, we, we didn't make, we made very few, if any, like programs. And we, these are all like policy and practice spaces. Right, and so so many people think that equity, diversity, inclusion is like a program. Well, how do we do our outreach? How do we do our whatever? And it's it's we haven't even we haven't gotten there yet. Like one of the things we have done um, is in, to be more accessible is we have um, we're now doing uh, live captioned and uh, live interpreted uh, webinars. We have a few of those coming up, right? But that is a it's a small program, but it's not. The, the, that's not the point. We've had to do a lot of other things to get there. So, those are my slides. Actually, if you could leave it on on that one, because this is where I want to hear some thoughts, some questions. This is where we can really talk about ways in which you think you can engage with these in your own work. Thank you all for your time. Yes. Um, I was just curious about hearing more about the work that's done in back to the caucuses conversation okay. about the POC caucus. Um, it just seems like such a great opportunity, great space to create, and then the, the type of work that's been done because I mean there's dismantling white supremacy, but then there's also the issues within different POC groups, and you know what I mean. Yes. And like POC is such a big term; they involve so many different groups. Um, so some of the work we've done. Uh, did everybody hear the question? Sorry. Uh, what is the work that's been done internally in the POC groups? Um, and frankly, my approach as the facilitator of the group has been to we, we only do the work that people need to do in the moment. Um, because it, it is actually one hour at work where work is not on the agenda for a variety of reasons. So people want, we've had questions, we've had conversations about like um, in intra-group racism, we've had conversations about like the intersectionality of, of people's different identities, um, conversations just about, you know, Kind of the group to group space, like what happens, you know, what is like anti blackness in that space, right? Like, we've had some very candid conversations, um, but it's very much been about what do people need in the space. Like, I'm super focused on this idea, and people can operate it differently, but on this idea that doesn't necessarily need preparation, all it needs is your presence, right? Um, so, if you show up, and if that's what you want to talk about today, you have to check in. That's what we can engage in. Because um, I don't want the POC caucus specifically to feel like another task where you have to perform being of color. <laughs> you know, where, where we have to like do, you, you don't have to be anything but present and available. Um, and I, I think people have been served in that space. Like there's nothing that you can't bring up. And so sometimes we have conversations that are super light. I'm just like, this is what my day was like. I'm here, it's cool. And other days we have some real, real conversations about what it means to be us in, in space and at work and like 
you know, we once had, uh, we had a conversation about compensation and our caucus was immediately after that and we all just sat and we were like, we need to do this without them <laughs> for a minute. And like, we had a whole conversation about like what it means to, to be people of color, like having this compensation conversation and like what it could mean for, for upper mobility and, and just the, those are just, Topic. So all of that to say, it is it is addressing, but it, it it the work the work that happens is the work that needs to happen in a given moment. Not we, we very much try not to set an agenda, so it doesn't need to feel like another meeting. Yes. Uh, off of the uh, caucusing point again, um, does uh, when when the, the people of color caucus. They have the conversations, and the person who comes from the white caucus to report. Is there another step after that where issues that may have been brought up in either caucus get addressed between the two caucuses? Um, no. So, so the the idea of like, is there a you know a kind of full forum. full form for everyone? Yeah. And it's no, actually, um, we. It has just been helpful to us. I mean, it's not that we are kind of opposed to that space, but it's been helpful to us to have these separate spaces to deal with them. Um, it is, yeah, no, it, what's been funny is that it, only the white people have asked for um, an integrated caucus, um, which is a sign to me that we do not need one yet. <laughs> um, you know, no, but not, none of the POC have been like, when do we get to talk about this with the white people? Um, and that it just that has quite because of that it shows that like there is an there may be a need uh, for the white caucus to show the work that they're doing and the POC are, are not ready for that we're seeing the work in other ways but we don't necessarily need this like what may feel like a performative meeting so we we aren't pushing for it if and if if the needs change then maybe but that's not the thing I realize I'm looking over here I'm gonna come I'm gonna come over here and come back. Uh, why do you think that your flat tier salaries support your goals? So I'm so used to hearing pay for performance, and how does this help? Um, yeah, so I, I am one who is, I'm a pay for performance person. I don't know if you guys heard me say how much I love money. Um, <laughs> so I, I had a very hard time with that. Um, and we've gone back and forth and back and forth. Um, because I, I have a really hard time with the notion that um, someone who's a super high performer gets paid the same as someone we're about to let go. I just fundamentally can't wrap my brain around that. I think high performers should be rewarded. Um, however, I also have to balance that understanding with, um, with the notion that um, I know plenty of women, plenty of people of color who um, have found out, um, who have found out they're making a lot less than folks um, that who aren't as competent as they are. Um, I know plenty of people who have a hard time asking for a raise, um, you know, who go years without ever asking for a raise. Um, so I, I have to balance that, and, and the step tier that we have now, the two-step the two um, two step increase that you can get, um, and I should say one other problem I have with it. Um, learning to negotiate your salary is really important. Um, we have an overwhelmingly young staff. Many folks come to us their first time out of the job. And I'm like, you have to be able to justify your value because when you leave Fractured Atlas, you can go out into the world into some place, most places don't have flat salary, salary tiers. Um, so the step compensation is, is the, the push and pull of me trying to balance all those things, talking with my colleagues, um, Tim being awesome about, like Tim, hi Tim again. Um, I feel like I'm talking, he's like in the room. Um, uh, you know, Tim being aware of like, you know, there might be ways that we can tweak this and improve it, uh, but in the process, um, help our staff begin to be able to say concretely, these are the goals that I met this year, and this is why I deserve X step increase. Um, so it's a balance, and we're still figuring it out. I also want to offer, I'm, I'm somebody, as much as I love to talk, like negotiation is never in my strong suit. In, uh, that's not true. I tend to believe people are negotiating with me in good faith, good faith. Yep. in a way that I have found is not, is, is not great. Um, there are studies that show you know, the, the predominant kind of um, science or has said that like women, particularly women of color, are not, not quite, are not good negotiators and they found additional studies is actually not true that women are lied, women are lied to specifically in negotiations. Um, so it's less about not being a good negotiator and, and more about not actually negotiating on honest information. Um, 
So I'm, I, I offer that as a, as a counter to like, I'm somebody who very much supported the, the tiers, um, or not the tiers, supported the um, flat salaries, uh, because it was nice to just know that I could come in and like operate at an exceptional level and not then have to do the additional second work of justifying the work, because I've always, I've found, um, as somebody who I like to consider myself a high performer, I do good work, is that I have to do the work and then I have to go back and justify or explain why this work that was super valuable until people started talking about money, <laughs> like everybody appreciated and recognized as valuable until the conversation was about compensating me for that work, and then it was like, well, now, now there's numbers and metrics, now there's an additional like, burden to go back and like justify the stuff that was valuable until I asked you to pay for it. Um, so uh, for me, I, the, the notion of the flat tier, tier was like, this is what I do, this is what you're gonna pay me, these are the ways in which I can do, and I, it was less emotional labor to have to then do the pay for performance. Also, additionally, uh, behaviors, there's also studies that show that behaviors in black women are not seen as valuable in the same way that they are seen for um, white men specifically. So the same type of performance behaviors that can be adjusted or that can be evaluated or paid for. Um, so if I behave the exact same way that a high performing white man did, I would be viewed as less valuable for those exact same behaviors. Um, so it, it would also impact the negotiation because I would be doing the things, but because I am me, it would actually be viewed as a detriment and not as a positive. Um, I really like this slide and the suggestions for uh, personal things to do to uh, you change your language and uh, things you can Im implement in your own personal practice. Something that I've struggled with is how to manage up and sort of infiltrate leadership with the uh, importance of these, these values and we need to work on this as an organization. Do you have advice for for leading up? And I do. I'm gonna offer the advice is also connected to like my personality. Some stuff I just do until they tell me I can't do it anymore. <laughs> and then, because I found, this is one of my kind of tricks around racism, it's really hard to get people to argue for racism. <laughs> Oftentimes, and, and, and this is, I mean, this is real, in the sense of, it's, it's easy to say, it's, it's easy to fight against like making change, like, oh, it's too expensive, it's too expensive to have the policy. But if, if a thing already exists, um, it's harder for somebody to take it away because then they are, they are fighting for the oppressive policy. And people's own like instinct, they don't wanna, they don't wanna be that guy. <laughs> um, so sometimes it's worth it to see how can you set them up to be that guy. <laughs> how can you say, you know, we did, the, we did the thing and you didn't even notice, it didn't cost any money and this is where we are. And like, I, I own that that's a risk. But sometimes it's worth it to just, what can you do that you don't necessarily need permission for and then if somebody is like, why did you do that? You can say, oh, well, it, it impacted these three things. And to not do it would do these terrible things. What do you think? Um, and that's a, and, and it's, a, it's a great way to let people be on the right side of history just accidentally. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they, just, they just showed up there. Um, because it, it is harder. It is harder to make the moral case to stay racist and oppressive than it is to um, it is to do the inverse. I'm gonna, I'm, there's still questions. I'm gonna put the slide oh, up. I just wanted to ask, how often do you host the caucuses? Every month. Every single month? Yeah, every month. Yes? Um, it seems like nowadays a lot of organizations are getting more comfortable using the terms diversity and inclusion. But anti-racism and being anti-racist, I think, is a more radical term. And I'm, I'm really envious of, I think, your organization's kind of ownership of that word. And I'm just curious, was there any journey to get to that word or what you kind of see as the differentiation of those terms or that work that we can kind of take back to our organization? You have more of a history with that. I've, we've never, I mean, in the two years I've been there, I, we've never you said DEI or anything else. Yeah. We were, we talked about active, I mean, the anti-racism, anti-oppression. Yes. I think it, um, part of what it was was the idea of fighting all oppression was too big, right? And, and EDI, equity, diversity, inclusion, can be very, can feel generic. And there are some very, there are arguments that I believe um, that are 
connected to the idea that racism, particularly in this country, is like the foundation of a lot of the oppressions, mm -hmm. right? Like if you, if you can start here, you can also get to other things. And I'm, I'm, not, include, I'm not excluding any other ism as its own individual thing. But there are ways in which the structures in this country are built on racism and, and layered also other oppressions on top of it. So um, when Adam, our former CEO, like focused on that, it felt like the chunk that he that he could honestly commit to. You know, um, so we are an anti-racist organization, and that's the the the, the focus that we're giving it. That doesn't mean we're like pro-sexist, right? <laughs> right? It's like we are fighting oppression in a variety of ways, but the the where we're hanging our hat right now is is anti-racism because it gives us purpose and it gives us clarity. Yeah, and I would also put a finer point on on that with regard to this sector in particular. Um, you know, working in the sectors I came from, you know, homeless services and in education. There's really, the disparity is really clear. You know that children of color in certain zip codes have a much different educational experience. Regardless, like, that's not a gender conversation, the conversation the education sector has is just about race. This sector, everybody's like a special, unique person <laughs> with all of their special, unique experiences. Um, so I, I do think it's really important when I talk, I talk about racism. I tend to not talk about gender, I tend to not talk about, um, about disabilities, and like none of that, because it is that like racism is the foundation of the structure of this country. Um, and if you don't center racism there, everybody wants their specialness to bubble up and you end up having a conversation about nothing and you're just trying to not to trying to avoid everyone's feelings. Um, so it's important to be specific. Um, and I've been in a number of conversations with um, white people, white women in particular, who who center themselves in a way that's really hard to have a conversation. Um, and I think it's really easy to beat on white guys, but in these conversations especially, white women show up in a way that's really hard to handle. Um, and it's hard to get to the meat of the reason you feel this way is because racism. Like racism taught every other ism how to behave. Um, and and that's, that is maybe not unique to this sector, but it feels very different than other sectors I've worked in. Uh, one of the things that I found fascinating about what, your work is how you guys, um, created the staff timeline and engaged the staff uh, with the trainings early on. And I was wondering if for organizations that are exploring, you know, we're in the early stages of exploring that kind of work for our own individual organizations. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you guys decided to go with YK Hong and Carol McCord and Equity Quotient Team? How did, you, was it recommendation, prior experience with them? How did you decide to go with them? My understanding was, I will preface this by saying, um, um, always ask for references, um, and really, uh, there's a way to do anti-racism training um, that moves your organization forward. There, um, so I think it's um, my understanding is that we put out well, we've always put out bids, um, and sometimes the lowest bid is great, sometimes maybe not. I'm trying to be uh, delicate here. Yeah. Um, Yep. And and but I would I was just getting started by you know asking folks who have had who have had positive experiences, um, and who have a train who have a staff of trainers if, depending upon your organizational size. Like you wouldn't put one teacher in a classroom with a hundred kids, um, or you know we know that like twenty is kind of hard for one person. So if you have a large staff, a largest staff, make sure that like the person you work with has the capacity to deal with with your organization and the complexity of your organization. Um, but mostly, I mean, I was just, just you know, asking around who's, who's done some good work um, and who's had positive experiences with, um, with a facilitator that is um, knowledgeable and direct. Um, I should also say that, like, um, I, like, it's important to have different frameworks. So one of the things that I'm kicking around right now is, you know, YK brought a particular perspective that was anti-oppression and anti-capitalist. Um, Carol brings a perspective that talks about, like, the role the arts plays in furthering racism. Um, and then folks' personal, um, personal identities, how those identities are expressed and received, and really with team building. For, we might do another session with Carol, maybe, and then we'll find someone else who might give another framework. Maybe it'll be someone who has a health perspective. Um, maybe it'll be someone who has an educational perspective and can talk about um, you know, how we're trained, how, our, how people see black women's pain you know, in a way that's totally different from seeing you know, white, men, white male pain. 
Um, so I think it's important to have a variety of frameworks, and what we want to do is give our staff a well-rounded understanding of all the different ways that our, our experiences in this country are shaped. This is where understanding what you value is, is helpful as an organization. It's also knowing like how, how will your organization respond to that. Like something, another fractured atlas like value that is unofficial, is we show up and we also get real deep real quickly. <laughs> <laughs> as a space, and it's and it's something that we never would have. That's not on again, not on any of our hiring documents or whatever. But like, if we are present, we will we go. <laughs> and that was also something that came out as a surprise. But like, we did these trainings, and people were just like, out feelings ready. And we're like, oh, okay, this is the thing we do. This is how we are we are present. You will be here. This is what happens. And knowing that allowed us to you know make different choices as we connected with other facilitators. Like, but we, we're good at, especially if we're all in the room, we can, we will, there were tears, there was feelings, we were there, and it was supportive. Like, but it's a collective energy that like, whatever reason people are engaging with. If that is not how your space operates, being aware of that is helpful. So it might be like, we also did like a half day training, then we did a full day training, then we did like a two day thing, right? So also knowing like, how does the space Work. How do you? How does this? How does this type of conversation go? So it might be worth it just to see who can you get to do a small thing, just to see where does this energy go? How does this room operate when we are in here? Are we ready to be vulnerable in this space and have these difficult conversations? Um, yes. Um, just curious, you know, even before that, taking those steps, how can you know the art sector that are either you know white led or Eurocentric? How can they recognize that a lot of the equity and diversity work that they're doing is performing? Because there is great value in coming out and saying, oh, we have these values, DI principles, blah, 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 and it looks fabulous on the grant, and you get that big donation from whomever. Um, I think that, quite frankly, personally, because I'm just speaking as a lady, um, that is a big hurdle that I think a lot of arts organizations, not just in Boston, but a lot of us really have to recognize and get over in order to move forward. That is a difficult question, because it, it, it also comes back to this, this kind of humanity debate question for me, like if, are you actually impacting something for someone, for people? Um, are pe and, and then are they willing to engage with that question? And if they're not, there's, there's very little to be done there, right? Which, and I, I don't want to sound so like negative, but it's a, it is a real thing. Like there's, there's a legit wall between like being willing to address equity from an honest and, and actually impactful space and performative. And, and you can't push people through that wall. You can call people out on it, but that is a, bunch of labor and sometimes, you know, it, it's, it, it can be like antagonistic and, and it can be difficult to do to say like, you did this thing, but the actual impact was nil. Um, but people have to, you can't necessarily force people to have a change of heart. Um, you know, like I kind of, of you know, maybe I'm like cynical, but there's a part of me that thinks like, I remember when people didn't sound racist all the time. Like, if you're just doing training so you can be quietly racist and like just sound like a regular ass person, that'd be really cool. Fair enough. <laughs> like, like it's, it's um, the, the, I think we're, again, like politics matters, place matters, time matters. Um, if folks are being trained to at least do 30% of the work they, never, they were never gonna do, and some of those performative actions are actually furthering a better experience for people of color and for, for folks who are sort of not straight white people, um, I think that's you know that's kind of important too because we're at a time when like every little bit every little thing you can do helps. Right. Because um, what we're seeing is this slide where like well is that actually is it racist or if I say it like can you just can you just sound like you care about my humanity right. like fake it can you fake it fake that is helpful yeah I mean I know that's cynical but that's kind of where I am with it no yeah I mean yeah I'm, I'm also a big believer I like the idea for like racism to be inconvenient for people. Um, so, so this idea that like, is there a way that we can 
And again, forcing people to argue for racism is a way to make it inconvenient. So if you, if somebody's doing something performative and if you have the opportunity to, to, to ask a kind of bad faith question, <laughs> and the bad faith question is, I saw that your intended impact was X. Did you feel that this thing accomplished that? Um, it's a great way to start a conversation. And then you can, there's, yay to the internet, there's so much research just to be like, it looks like actions like this don't tend to have the intended consequences that you want. Have you all, what have you all done to counter that? You know, I know you've read this thing, so like, talk to me about what you've done. Um, and I, it's manipulative, but it's helpful <laughs> to recognize that people don't want to, people don't necessarily want to appear racist, whether or not they want to be racist, sexist, whatever, we don't know. But oftentimes we don't want to appear that way. And so being able to have a conversation that makes, puts the onus on them to say why what they're doing is helpful can sometimes be a way into that conversation. Um, I mean, you talk about money. I mean, that's the other really real thing with the sector is, you know, the inequity in funding is astounding. Right. Like, um, and and my understanding is that large sort of predominantly white institutions effectively poach programming yes. um, from smaller institutions of color. And um, once once that shifts, and that starts with funders um, refusing to fund organizations that are that large, you probably don't need anything else. Um, and uh, with the organizations themselves, saying, I actually don't need this much. Um, Malcolm Gladwell did a podcast a while ago, and he had um, the, um, the, the school, the community college that was close to where I grew up in South Jersey, got like this huge $10 million grant, like in the early 90s, which totally changed, you know, this sort of funding race that's happened with colleges. Um, so he does this conversation with the, with sort of the development officer who secured this $10 million grant, which is transformational for rural South Jersey. Um, and so the development folks and the daughter of the guy who made, who's passed away, but the daughter of the guy who gave the grant. And then he goes and talks to the provost at Stanford. And Stanford now is in the midst of like, I think it's the first like multi-billion dollar capital campaign. Um, and he essentially says, if someone offered you you know, a hundred million or two hundred million or you know a billion dollars, and you've already got, you've already finished this billion campaign. Would you ever turn down this money? And his response is really interesting because you can. He says like, how would you spend it? And the guy's like, wheels are turning. And um, his his idea was he would use this one billion dollars to do a really exclusive you know new engineering program for a hundred students. Um, Rowan used their $10 million gift in the 90s to do an engineering school for anyone. They, they try to get as many students in there as much as possible to do the most they could with that money. Their building is now you know, 25 years old, but they're still, you know, they're graduating like five or 600 engineering students, primarily from low income rural communities. Um, so at some point, like, white institutions have to ask, like, how much is enough? Like, do you have enough to do what you do? And if so, and the other insidious thing about the Stanford dude was, he says, um, Malcolm Gladwell asked him, like, well, would you ever refer them to one of the UCs? Um, and he says, well, you know, the quality of their student body isn't great. He used some coded words about color. And he says, I wouldn't know, I couldn't refer them because I wouldn't trust them um, to use the money. Like, I couldn't vouch for the fact that, I, that they could be trusted to use the money the way they should. And that's like the insidiousness of, of how whiteness works. Um, it's a fascinating podcast, because if someone asked me, like, how would you, I mean, I would obviously go with, I would, like, build something for the masses. Right. Um, when he said he wanted to serve 100 students. Um, and that's the hard pill to swallow, which is, like, your institution, fundamentally, your institutions have to change. Um, because the institutions are racist. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's just it. It's in the paint. It's in, no, but it's, it's in the paint. It's in the walls, right? And so that's why I keep going back to, and one, you can do whatever you can, throw whatever you can at it, but two, there are some things you can't change, right? You can't shift the Washington Monument like three feet to the left, right? You can't do it. It is, it is where it is, right? You can tear it down, <laughs> right? But, but you have to know what type of battle you're facing. Um, and like, it, it, so it's worth it to understand that and, and you know, go where you're wanted in a variety of, in a variety of ways. And so the thing to do, the onus that you can do, is ask 
the institutions that you wish to take your resource to if you are wanted there. And then, if we can, if, if we make it so inconvenient for people to not want anyone, more places will be, val will be valuable, right? Like if we can, if, if, if everybody finds that these resources that are us are going to places where they are wanted, people will have to change just practically. Um, and that is part of, that's, that's part of what we're getting at. So admitting, admitting defeat is a thing that you can do personally. I'm, I'm not gonna move the Washington Monument three feet to the left, it's not gonna happen. So I have to, I either have to tear it down or, or find a new task. We'd, we'd be here all day, I just want to be respectful of Lauren and Courtney's time. Yeah. So thank you so much cool. for being here. Thank you. Thank you all.